Well, thank you so much for organizing this event. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to meet with you. And I'm looking forward to the question and answer session as well. And so, as was mentioned, I'm from the University of Florida. We are known for being the Gators. So I have a Gator here. Uh, it's a beautiful location. If ever you're in Florida, please come by. So today I'm going to be talking about biotechnology applications uh, of archaea with emphasis on the halophilic archaea, which is the main organism type I work with. So what are halophilic archaea and where are they from? So halophilic archaea are from these amazing hypersaline environments that have extreme salt, uh, including, let me get a pointer here. There we go. As you can see here, uh, natural brines, hypersaline lakes. The organism I actually work with a lot is coming from the Dead Sea. And some of these even can be um, revived from rock salt inclusions uh, that are considered to be millions of years old. And as we're starting to learn more about um, planets such as Mars, uh, we're learning that there actually is evidence for saltwater flow and subsurface lakes that have a lot of features uh, that would be compatible with halophilic archaea surviving. And so they've gotten a lot of interest in astrobiology, and people have even found that they can survive uh, uh, the stratosphere, where you can send them up and then actually culture them afterwards. So they have a lot of features that are compatible with life on Mars. They're even closer to our own self in that we have halophilic archaea in our food. Um, if you eat a lot of high salt fermented seafood or fish sauce, uh, halophilic archaea are found in those types of, of foods and obviously bay salt and other types of salted foods. And now we're even learning that halophilic archaea are found on our own human microbiome. Uh, they're detected and even isolated from gastrointestinal tract and even our belly buttons. So uh, uh, they're not simply limited to extreme environments. We, we are finding them on the human microbiome. So when we look at the um, tree of life, as we call it, and start looking at the phylogenetic classification of halophilic archaea, what we're finding is that they're actually uh, quite closely related uh, to us, to eukaryotes, when you compare it to bacteria. And so you, if you look at this tree of life, uh, this large group here are bacteria, and we, when we look at archaea and halophilic archaea compared to eukaryotes, which we classify too, you can see uh, this close relationship. So when we start looking at features of archaea, you can imagine they have features that are distinct, yet also some aspects that are more eukaryotic-like. And in this case, we're looking at uh, the cell walls and membranes of archaea, which are distinct from bacteria and eukaryotes. And what you're seeing are then these unusual archaeal phospholipids um, that have ether linkages instead of the typical ester linkages that you're used to with bacteria or eukaryotes. And they also have these um, isoprenoid uh, chains for the cell, cell membrane lipids. And these are quite useful for biotechnology uh, many people are using them and uh, forming archaeosomes with the um, halophilic as well as the other archaeal lipids. And they can use them for drug delivery systems for vaccines and proteins and peptides and nucleic acids. They're very dif different from our lipids and are very stable. In fact, some archaea even have these monolipid layers that can be extremely stable. Uh, and useful for delivery systems. As uh, has gotten a lot of press, you can imagine, 
with polymerase, polymerase chain reaction, archaeal DNA polymerases are also uh, very useful and, and halophilic archaeal polymerases are being, uh, uh, DNA polymerases are being examined for this. Um, they're, they're useful and highly stable for uh, high fidelity PCR as well as then some polymerases are useful for this error prone PCR. And so DNA replication and modification machinery enzymes of archaea, uh, you can imagine these extremophilic properties are very useful for uh, biotechnology. Now, archaeal transcription is an interesting mixture. It's a mixture of more eukaryotic-like basal transcription machinery, where they have promoters and Tata binding box boxes that are recognized um, uh, by this basal transcription machinery that's very eukaryotic-like. But then they have this mixture of activators and repressors uh, that are uh, more bacteria-like and also some unique archaea ones. And so when you're looking at biotechnology and looking at engineering archaea for expressing genes and so forth, you definitely have to consider the promoter configuration and how it do does definitely differ from a typical bacterial system uh, that people work with. Interestingly, in archaeal translation, um, Transcription and translation are coupled much like in bacteria, and the genes are organized in operons. Um, but there are subgroups of archaea that have primarily what are called leaderless transcripts, where the transcription and the translation start site are the same. And so this is true for the halophilic archaea that um, I work with. And so when you're engineering high level production of of proteins and so forth, you need to take that into consideration that the mRNA transcripts that are being made oftentimes do not have a leader on them, a five prime, prime, five prime untranslated region. And so there are unique aspects of archaeal translation that must be considered. And one of the main systems my lab has uh, been working on is uh, a ubiquitin-like proteasome system that's found in halophilic archaea as well as other archaea that's very much related to eukaryotic systems. And in this system, small proteins called ubiquitin or ubiquitin-like proteins are attached to protein targets and can be targeted for degradation or at times even stabilized by these types of modifications. And so we're working toward um, engineering this type of system to promote certain processes that we would like for biotech applications. And so um, this targeted attachment of protein modifiers to protein targets has a lot of advantages when you're trying to control cell function. So I've been talking about archaea in general, but there, there's a lot of unusual properties about halophilic archaea that are uniquely adapted for biotech applications. So halophilic archaea live in a high salt environment. And typically, when you think of a normal cell that's in an extremely high salt environment, a non-halophilic cell, you're going to have water rushing out of the cell and you're going to have lysis. I can't handle that high salt environment. There are moderate halophiles that can handle somewhat high salt environments. And a lot of these moderate halophiles use what's called a salt out strategy, where they make organic compatible solutes that then uh, maintain this homeostasis of osmotic homeostasis and prevent this lysis from occurring. And this is very energy expensive. These are a lot of organic compounds that must be synthesized in the cell in order to handle this high salt environment. The, the organisms I work with, these halophilic archaea, are very different. They use what's called a salt-in strategy. And so 
what they're doing is they're exchanging the sodium ion to the outside of the cell and bringing potassium ions into the cell. And so these potassium ions are more compatible with the protein uh, to, to maintain activity. And the overall salt of these halophilic archaea, the concentration is the same on the inside as the outside. And this is how they maintain homeostasis. So it's very different from any other types of cells we've seen on the planet. Um, and so again, they're, they're exchanging the sodium and the potassium ions, but overall this, they have this unusually high salt internal cytosol. So this makes their proteome very different from other organisms. And so when you, when you look at the genome sequence and you predict what the proteins will be, and ultimately the, the isoelectric point of the proteins, what you see is then, I have it in bluish here, the halophilic archaea, and you can see the isoelectric point is extremely acidic. And this is very different from normal proteomes. What this means then is that the proteins, when you look at them, and here's one I'm showing from Halopharax, it's got this amazingly acidic shell, which is being represented here in red. Uh, and this is thought to enable the enzyme to maintain flexibility in a high salt environment. And then we're looking at, in comparison, this is from a hyperthermophilic archaean that is very thermostable, but can't handle this high salt as well. And you can see then um, where you have basic and some hydrophobic and apolar residues showing up there in addition to the acidic residues. So these halophilic archaea, the vast majority of their proteins are gonna have this amazing acidic shell. What this means is these proteins can handle low water activity. So when you start putting these enzymes into solvents, like for example, here's DMSO, but even methyl cellulosol and other kinds of solvents that are used in depolymerization of biomass, or even in pharmaceutical industry, where you're trying to maintain organic compounds in a soluble state, um, these enzymes can actually tolerate that and are oftentimes active in those types of solvents, which is very unusual. Most enzymes can't handle that. Um, not only are these enzymes stable in the organic solvent again, but they're actually oftentimes active in it. And I'm showing you here an example of inorganic pyrophosphatase that we've been working with. And um, as DNA sequencing is getting more and more into organic solvent type of environments, to drive the polymerization reaction in DNA sequencing, you need these kind of enzymes like pyrophosphatase to drive the reaction forward. And so uh, people are looking more and more at these types of organic solvent tolerant enzymes. Here's a great example, a master in the, in the field of halophilic archaea as far as an enzyme that can really handle very low water activity and it's called bacteriorhodopsin. This is an enzyme that has one or two molecules of water. It's still functional. And this is, if you've heard of halophilic archaea have what are called purple membranes and bacteriorhodopsin is responsible for that. It's a retinal based proton pump. When light hits it, it actually pumps ions to the outside of the cell. And that's what's being shown here, these uh, protons being pumped out. And people now have put this on films and so forth. This enzyme, it's still active and are starting to engineer it for bioelectronics. And it even is being used uh, in self-powered artificial retina and, and is showing promise to enable meaningful sight. And so um, not only can these enzymes handle organic solvent, but in this case, you can imagine it's very low water activity where the enzyme is actually being placed on a film and still um, active in that kind of environment. The other interesting thing about halophilic archaea is that they have a 
TAT system, a twin arginine translocation system, that is one of the predominant ways that they're secreting proteins in comparison to other, when you look evolutionarily, they have a much higher usage of the TAP pathway than most organisms do. And these are, these are systems, what I'm showing here are systems in the cell membrane that are involved in translocating proteins to the outside of the cell. Um, so this is then the outside of the cell and this is the inside. And you might have heard of the sex system that is translocating unfolded proteins through the cell membrane. And then in contrast, the TAT system can translocate folded proteins to the outside of the membrane. The advantage if you're engineering a metalloenzyme for high level secretion and production to the outside of the cell, if you have an organism that can that has a high level of TAT system functioning, you can actually get a high level synthesis of metalloproteins secreted to the outside of the cell because uh, you can then insert the metal centers and so forth into the protein before it's secreted. And so we've actually taken advantage of that. I'll show you later uh, an example of a lacase we've been working on. So again, um, I do work with halophilic archaea. They are amenable to genetic engineering. And the organism we work with is Halophorus volcanii. It's really this ideal model organism because it's a facultative anaerobe. You can work with it on the bench. And you can imagine it grows in this high salt environment. And so it's really hard to contaminate uh, because most things won't grow in that high and salt environment. So if you're doing any kind of teaching work or whatever, these organisms are actually pretty easy to use in high schools and so forth. We have people buying grocery store type of items, um, even salt from um, the grocery store and able to then uh, do work in laboratory settings, uh, um, laboratory settings that may not have that much uh, access to sterile technique. But because it's a facultative anaerobe, um, you can then grow, with it, grow it in the presence of oxygen or look at it on these alternative electron acceptors. And it metabolizes a wide variety of carbon sources. And uh, in particular, we're interested in glycerol because that's one of the predominant carbon sources in the Dead Sea that it's encountering. Uh, because of the Denelia blooms will bloom, the algal blooms, they're again making all these organic solvents, and then they bloom, and then the halophilic archaea such as this take over and start metabolizing the glycerol. Glycerol is a big component of biodiesel waste, and so, and this organism prefers glycerol over glucose. We've uh, demonstrated that uh, with um, some uh, uh, metabolic work. And um, the nice thing is then you can actually produce carotenoids, which are of high value, as well as then bioplastics and other products. So biodiesel oftentimes has a lot of salt in the process. And so this organism actually can grow on biodiesel waste. And um, uh, that's uh, um, uh, of an advantage. So there are uh, plasmids available to shuttle in and promoters to express genes. And so this organism is amenable to genetic manipulation. And what I'm showing here then are just some examples of uh, lacase here that was secreted to the outside of the cell, as well as then the proteasome complex we've been working with where you can tag proteins and then express them and purify them with are what are called affinity chromatography type of methods. And so uh, this organism is amenable to all of that. The other thing is we can selectively delete genes. And so there is this ability to do targeted gene knockout methods in this organism. And how we do that, we have flanking regions uh, of the gene that we put on a plasmid and delete the gene and then have a, a plasmid that does not have the origin of replication for the organism. And we have this uracil synthetic marker 
And then we're able to then recombine uh, the DNA onto the chromosome of this organism by selecting for growth in the absence of uracil because we have a uracil mutant. And then we, so we can pop in and then we use 5-FOA to pop out. So it's very much like a yeast method for uh, deleting genes on the chromosome. And we can then select for or screen for a wild type versus the deletion mutant and uh, be able to have this targeted uh, mutagenesis type of approach. The other thing is transformation is very straightforward. Uh, we have a, a method we've published uh, in uh, uh, methods of enzymology to very clearly uh, deal in, uh, you know, describe how to transform this organism and um, can work with people uh, visually as well as needed if you'd like to get this kind of transformation method going in your laboratory. Uh, we basically strip off the S layer and make spheroplasts and do this kind of PEG mediated uh, transformation protocol. And so we can delete genes and put in plasmids and so forth. And it's a, it's a pretty powerful system for uh, making different enzymes and uh, bioproducts. So here I'd just like to show you an example of high level secretion of a lacase by this organism. So again, uh, we make this genetic construct and put it into the organism and overexpress uh, the protein in the, in the cell. And in this case, this is a uh, enzyme that's a metalloenzyme. It has multiple copper centers and those copper centers are are put into the enzyme inside the cell and then it, the, the TAT system secretes this enzyme to the outside of the cell. And so basically we just remove the cells and have practically purified enzyme. And then we uh, um, are able to mediate various biocatalytic reactions with this lacase. It's a very environmentally friendly enzyme. It uses oxygen and we can make these um, der derivatized phenols and make these ph phenoxy radicals that then can go on to form various polymers. And so there are a lot of applications for this particular enzyme. I'm just giving one example. And, and the nice thing about this lacase then is that it can operate in the presence of organic solvents. And a lot of times uh, when processing uh, 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 bio uh, products such as straw, wood, and energy crops, these lignocellulosic biomass products, um, you're ultimately then extracting lignin in the organic solvents. And now if you have enzymes that can function on these lignin, lignin phenolics in the presence of organic solvents, uh, you have a powerful tool. And so the question is, what other types of enzymes from these high salt tolerant organisms, and there are some cellulases and so forth uh, that people are discovering. So in summary, uh, halophilic archaea, they are from these hypersaline environments, uh, salted foods, even the human microbiome. They're closer to home than we thought. Finding People finding them in the belly button was quite a surprise at the time. Uh, they are classified to this archaea domain of life, which has relationship to eukaryotic cells and is very distinct from bacteria in that regard. Um, they have features, uh, cell structure function features that are uh, unique to them as well as then shared with bacteria and eukaryotes. And they have this very unusual salt in strategy uh, for maintaining osmotic homeostasis. Uh, which makes their proteins very amenable to this um, ability to function in high salt, high organic solvents, and high temperature. And really, they're an ideal platform for this metalloprotein or metalloenzyme secretion. Um, really, uh, with the engineered strain that we have, you can get uh, pretty much the main product that's being secreted be the, the protein of interest. And there are all these genetic tools available for metabolic engineering. 
So now uh, we come to how can these extreme properties be applied to the field of biotechnology? We have a lot of multidisciplinary approaches now available. Uh, traditionally, we had been working in the biochemistry of them. And now with genome sequence, we have more information to move on to do genetics and cell biology type of approaches. And uh, you can imagine then with the computational tools available, uh, we now have this ability to do a lot of 3D modeling and predict what enzymes are going to be doing um, and then go to the biochemical analysis and, and confirm that. There's a lot of power in um, the amount of 3D structures that are out there to then enable us to do modeling. And uh, proteomics enables us to um, detect proteins and post-translational modifications that we've been looking at. And now we're getting into other kind of omics with, um, you can imagine with uh, metabolomics and tRNA mass, base, base mass spec to look at RNA modifications. Um, there are a lot of tools out there to start addressing these questions with multi multidisciplinary approaches. And, you know, more recently now with the artificial intelligence and other computational biology tools that we have, um, uh, we're integrating all of these together. And so I definitely want to thank all of the people that have been working with me um, in this area, my laboratory, including graduate students, postdocs, undergrads, and collaborators. I also want to point out that um, if you're considering going to graduate school, you may want to consider the University of Florida. Uh, we're now in the top five universities in the US. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. We have our admissions, our deadline is application is December 15th. And then also, I do want to point out that the Journal of Bacteriology is uh, very much interested in uh, papers that are involving basic microbial cell structure function, including archaeal cell biology. And I, so I've become an editor of that journal recently. And I encourage you to think about your next manu manuscript, submitting it to the Journal of Bacteriology. And so I'd like to leave it for that. And thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.